All right, we've got Dylan back joining us on the stage again, talking about getting shells from JavaScript, so please welcome him to the Tour Camp stage. Thanks for the kind intro. Um, so, like, I, I kind of mentioned this in the, the first talk I gave, but I, uh, this is my first time attending Tour Camp, and I didn't quite nail the motif um, on some of my talks, so this is a little um, on the technical side. And I'm going to try to do my best to decode a lot of that, but um, there's no uh, like creme, creme brulee involved to in this, this talk. Um, so um, that being said, um, I'll go ahead and get into it. Basically, the, the premise of this talk is, is kind of just like highlighting some stuff that's already kind of, I think, well known by the security community. But I, I, the way I kind of tie it together and some of the bug bounties that I've submitted to, I think can kind of paint some of this in a, in a new light. Um, so mo most, or a lot of people may be familiar with like the beef browser exploitation framework that, that takes basically cross-site scripting to like the next level of like getting a, a, an implant and like surveying internal networks a little bit. Um, really my intent is to, is to kind of push that one step further of like basically highlighting how, how crazy the idea of like a, a web browser is in the first place. Like let's go to untrusted websites and take code from them and run it in a sandbox way and then allow that code to make arbitrary network requests on every single network that I'm sitting on. Like, if you laid that out to somebody in the 80s, that would sound insane. But this is kind of the way we've rolled with it um, and we're kind of at that, that point now. Um, and I just want to show a couple of um, ways that you can take advantage of, of specifically that, of sitting on privileged networks and going to the internet and running code and then being able to affect the privileged network that you're on. Um, but to get there, I need to go through some kind of dry web appy stuff. So hopefully everybody can bear with me for that. Um, so there's there's kind of like this, this fallacy that I'm sure everybody in the room knows is like if, if we have like a really hardened outside, then like we can we can have the inside like really soft and gooey. So like a company can, can spend a lot of time like hardening the exterior, but like all of the, the interior assets, maybe they'll leave that a little more soft. Um, and I say it's a fallacy because like the reality is like whatever your mechanism is for breaking in, um, whether it's phishing or through a, a you know a browser exploit or a USB stick in the parking lot, um, it's 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 relatively easy to do and, and really hard to secure that out external perimeter. And if your inside is GUI, then then you can just move around really easily. Um, and, and this talk is basically just showing another way of, of getting that first implant that doesn't involve phishing or a USB stick in the parking lot. Um, so like I, I had this idea in my head of, of when I was like first entering this industry of like how much damage can really be done if you click a link. Like most people don't have browser exploits. Most of the malicious links that are sent around probably don't have a zero day in Chrome. Um, Flash is on its way out. Like uh, they've, already, I think they've already announced an end of life date. Um, they've, there's tons and tons of exploits still left in Flash, but Chrome disable is it by default, so that's that's not really a vector as much anymore. Um, and and in general, folks are weary about downloading files. So if you send them to a malicious link and it and it forces a, an exe download, I, I think like most people at this point know not to run that. Um, so I, you know, that was a question that I had kind of like sat on for a while. Like you, you click a link, but like so what? Like, like how much damage could be done? Um, so, you know, to get into the weeds here, um, I, I have to sort of in depth go over um, cross-site request forgery and cross-site scripting, and, and then it's going to be dry for like the next three, four slides, but then we'll get to the more interesting stuff um, after, after we get through it. Um, so hopefully everybody can bear with me for that. Um, basically, at, at a high level, the same origin policy is like the fundamental browser security mechanism. Like you, you visit... Facebook.com, and you want to be confident that Facebook.com cannot steal any data from Google, and it cannot affect any change on your Google account. Um, so we have the sandbox that separates the two origins, and the, the rules which allow you to um, get data are dictated by the same origin policy, and it's sort of self-describing. It, it, it limits you to only be able to do those within the origin that you're on with a couple of exceptions. And those exceptions are kind of interesting. We'll talk about some of them. Um, so basically, um, 
take this with a grain of salt. This is the way the rules should be. Now, browsers will often break this when they come out with new features and stuff like that. But fundamentally, there are two different types of HTTP requests in a browser. Um, there's the simple kind, and then there's the non-simple kind. And I didn't define that terminology. That was defined by specification. Uh, a simple request is one that is either get, post, or head, and any of the content types you see on the left. Um, and you can't have any custom headers. It has to be a very vanilla request, one that you might get from a web form. A, a typical request a website makes would fall into a simple request. A non-simple request is the type of request you start seeing in single page apps and more complicated websites where maybe they set the content type to application JSON or maybe they set a custom header. Maybe they use a method that's not get, post, and head. Maybe they're using like a REST framework and so they use put and delete. Um, those types of requests are defined as non-simple. And the difference between those two with regards to the same origin policy is a simple request from Facebook if you visit facebook.com and they send you JavaScript, that JavaScript can force your browser to make a request to Google, if it's simple. And that request is credentialed. It'll include your credential if you're currently logged into Google, um, which doesn't sound great, but that's just the way we've architected the internet. <laughs> um, and non-simple requests require some validation ahead of time to make sure that you're actually allowed to make that request. So a request is made ahead of time um, by the browser under the hood with a method called options that basically goes to the website in question and says, am I allowed to make this request? And then the server responds either yes or no or nothing at all. And if it doesn't explicitly say yes, then that request can't be made. Um, so these kind of dictate the rules which allow you to make requests from one origin to another. Um, and so this is the complicated flow, the pre-flighted flow. First, you want to make a request. You ask the server permission. Do I have permission? And then the server responds back, yes, you have permission to make a request with these methods to this origin um, with credentials or without credentials. And then the browser goes ahead and makes the request. Um, that seems like the flow that all requests should follow. But there's kind of this caveat of an older time um, where you can make simple requests without having to ask permission. Facebook can force you to make a request to Google, uh, a credentialed request on your behalf. Um, and so that's, that's what that looks like. It's just an immediate request. Um, and then the server responds at that point, um, allowing your browser um, either to view the content of that response or not to view the content of the response. So you're allowed to make the request, but then the server can set some rules allow, uh, around whether or not the JavaScript can read the response. Um, and like I mentioned before, this is kind of super dry, but it'll get more interesting in a minute. Um, so this is kind of like the traditional way that you'll um, imagine um, cross-site request forgery working. You um, visit evil.com. Evil.com can then force you to send credential requests to Google. And if there's a state-changing operation that Google has available, um, they can potentially force you to change state on your Google account, um, which is, is crazy. It's insecure by default. And we have to engineer these really wacky solutions to make that harder to do. And, and I'll get into that a little bit. Um, basically, the way we've fixed that is outside of the browser, we've hacked this artificial pre-flight on top of all of our requests that basically say, before you make this request, make another request that fetches a token from Google. And then on the state changing request, include that token to prove that you've been able to successfully read the response of a previous simple request. And that whole flow sounds crazy, insecure by default, and stupid, um, because it is. <laughs> um, but this is kind of just the way we've architected the internet. Um, so like the conventional way of thinking about cross-site request forgery is like it's an attack on a user. Um, I can force a user to do a state changing attack, or, or to do a, a state changing action on their account. If they're logged into Facebook and Facebook doesn't implement this wacky pre-flighting thing into their application, I can force them to change their status, or I can force them to add me as a friend. Um, I can't view the response from that, because Facebook is never going to grant me permission to view the data that comes back. But if they don't implement all that weird token stuff, um, then I can, I can do things on their behalf if they visit my website. Um, that's the classical way of thinking about cross-site request forgery. And it is by far the most convoluted, complicated web attack that I know of. 
um, just the way we built this and the reason it's insecure by default and it's not intuitive and I have to like, explain all this in a really boring way for people to understand it. Um, it it, it kind of just sucks. Um, but uh, really what I want to focus on on this talk is, is kind of what I highlighted a little bit earlier. Um, you visit a website on the internet, but your web browser, it sits on a lot of different networks. It sits on localhost. It sits on your corporate network, right? And if you're not Google and you're not running a weird Beyond Corp situation, your browser can talk to your coworkers. Um, so you may visit evil.com, and evil.com then has the ability to make requests to your coworker or to an internal server. Um, and that's pretty scary. Um, and so like that's that's kind of the way I I am trying to push people to think about cross-site request forgery. That it's not just an attack on users. Um, it, it can also be an attack on your infrastructure. That if if you visit a link and that link has malicious JavaScript, that JavaScript can make arbitrary requests to your internal network. And that can be really scary. And I'll give some examples. Um, what makes this worse is recently browsers implemented this like peer-to-peer -peer, um, way for two browsers to talk to one each other without a server involved. And I am not a network engineer, and I'm not going to pretend to know all the nuances of how or why this works the way it does. But one byproduct of it is it exposes your internal IP address to any website. So you go to a random website. That website um, has the ability to pull the IP address of your local network, not just your public IP address. Um, and from that information, they can then guess what IP addresses your coworkers are, guess what IP addresses the servers on your infrastructure are. Um, and that's, that's just the way it is. And different browsers do this differently. Some browsers will give like one internal IP address. Other browsers will give every single internal IP address that you're sitting on, um, which can include the IP address of um, the network if you're on a VPN. Um, I think Firefox usually gives a lot more information. Um, and that kind of sucks. <laughs> um, and so, you know, if, if folks are familiar with Metasploit, um, it's, it's a malware framework and it's an archive of exploits. Um, and there is a, a, a section of Metasploit of HTTP exploits. After you've compromised a host, usually this is when it's, it's, it's used, you compromise a host and then you want to move to other hosts within the environment these are all the HTTP exploits that are available. Like basically if an internal host is running Jenkins or something like that, um, it'll fall into the HTTP modules in Metasploit. And if you compromise one host and your coworker is running Jenkins, you can move from your host to their host with this HTTP exploit. But what was interesting is when I went through this list of exploits, not only like, so it, it's a big list of remote code execution over HTTP the vast majority of these had no built-in protection against cross-site request forgery, which means like you don't just have to think of it as a means of like, I've already compromised a host, and now I'm going to move laterally from that host to another host. Instead, you have to think of this as, what if I just visit a malicious web page, and then they get information about my internal subnet through WebRTC, and now all of a sudden they can start slamming my internal network with all of these cross-origin requests, because the browser allows it, um, and their remote code executions that are all of a sudden phoning home to the attacker. Um, so some, some big ones I threw up on here, um, Jenkins, JBoss, Struts, PHP, MyAdmin. Um, the list is really, really long. Um, but these are all HTTP exploits that are also vulnerable to cross-site request forgery. And I'll caveat that by saying, Jenkins has um, a feature that you can turn on to protect against cross-site request forgery. Um, but you can also turn that option off. Um, and again, if you're dealing with a large company and law of large numbers, and the attacker is literally just sweeping your entire subnet, um, there's a good chance at least one person will have it turned on, or have the feature turned off, I should say. Um, so at, at a high-level overview, uh, a user clicks a link, the malicious web page loads JavaScript on the page, it obtains that user's internal IP address, even though they've clicked a link to a website on the internet, that page can now get information about the internal subnet handed to them by the browser. Uh, 
And now they can just sweep the entire internal subnet with whatever exploit payloads they want, um, maybe pulled out of the Metasploit library or maybe exploits that people haven't found yet. And I'm going to show how easy those are to find on some of these internal assets in a bit. Um, but basically, you know, you just clicked a link and then all of a sudden your coworker, your internal servers, your printers, they're all owned and phoning home, even though like there was never a browser exploit. There, the initial victim wasn't actually compromised. Well, they sort of were, but there, no shell command was ever ran on their host. Um, no malware implant was ever installed on their, um, on their computer. Um, and so like how long that takes? Um, well, it took me about 30 seconds with a really rudimentary try to sweep a, a slash 24. Um, so here you can see my internal IP address on the bottom there. And it took a particular exploit um, that I built out for one of the ones that I'd showed previously, slammed it in slash 24, all 255 hosts, um, and did it in about 30 seconds. Um, so it could be pretty quick, and I think this can actually be made faster with web workers and other hacks. Um, so it could potentially be even faster than that. Um, so, uh, so far I've talked about a relatively blind way of doing this. Somebody clicks a link and then you sort of just spray and pray. Um, but there's a way to do this a lot more targeted. Um, and I think recon in general has sort of become a lot more sophisticated in the last couple of years. A means to figure out what internal hosts are running at a company um, has just become really, really easy to do. And that's through a number of different means. Um, you could crawl through GitHub and look through their open source repositories, go through all of their old um, commits and just see references to internal hosts. I've used Trufflehog to do that before. Um, you could view certificate transparency logs, um, which is a log of every public certificate issued by a certificate authority. So if they have TLS on their internal hosts, you can figure out what their internal hosts are by this public log. Um, you can search VirusTotal. Basically, if you upload any file to VirusTotal, VirusTotal will parse out all the links and then make them available to everyone. Um, you could do good old-fashioned Google dorking. You could do good old-fashioned brute forcing with tools like Fierce. You can use passive DNS. There's companies with DNS probes that'll just watch everything fly past it and it'll make every host that it sees available to anyone who asks for it. Long story short, it's really, really easy to get a list of every internal host name. Um, and I've done this with a company that I was supposed to blur out but then forgot to, so pretend that you can't see which company that is. Um, and basically, um, you can see I was able to find you know, 48 subdomains that were, or sorry, 48 um, yeah, so subdomains of the company that were definitely internal subdomains. It was using their internal schema. Um, and then I was able to find 97 that were partially public and partially internal. Um, it's really, really easy to get the internal um, topology of a network this way. Um, and then if you sort of start to combine that with what I talked about earlier, let's, let's pick one. So here's a random subdomain from that list before. Um, it's, it's a piece of code that I've never heard of, um, gocd.devops.company.network. Uh, so I googled gocd and it was this open source thing. Um, so I was able to pull down this source code um, and stand it up locally, which you see here. And by default, there's no authentication on this system. Um, you can add authentication to it, but the default of just running it out of the box doesn't have auth. And that's a pretty good start. Um, and then when I sort of did some digging, it didn't take long for me to find a cross-site request forgery exploit on this system. And what's interesting here is if you think about a classical cross-site request forgery exploit, the ability to set a status, the ability to send an email, like that's relatively benign in the grand scope of attacking a company. But if you're targeting one of these internal tools, the scope just all of a sudden explodes. So this tool has the ability to build environments. It has the ability to stand up hosts. Um, and as it turns out, um, one of those endpoints, the ability to build an environment, doesn't have cross-site request forgery protection, which means I can now take this company's name, I can build a payload such that when a person visits an evil link, I'm specifically targeting that host and that piece of software which I found a specific exploit on, 
And if that link gets clicked, I can build an environment in their ecosystem. Um, that's pretty bad. Um, and it's really, really easy to find these types of exploits. These internal tools, these open source ones, are usually not audited. Um, they don't go through the same scrutiny that, say, a, a public bug bounty website may go through. They don't have intense security code reviews on them. They're usually really vulnerable, and they're usually in a position that can do a lot of nasty state changey things in your environment. Um, so, you know, a summary of everything I've talked about so far basically, you know, if your internal services aren't locked down, right, and you click a dangerous link, through a phishing email, through a watering hole attack, through whatever vector, um, that origin can move laterally from your browser to another host in the environment, which can be blind or it can be targeted, and then that host can get a malware implant and phone home um, without a browser exploit. <laughs> um, so I'm going to talk about another type of vulnerability here, um, one that folks are probably more familiar with, cross-site scripting. Basically, the idea um, behind cross-site scripting is if you visit a page and the page takes input from a user, say from the URL, um, and that input gets reflected back into the page in an unsafe way, that can lead to a malicious user running arbitrary JavaScript on that page. Um, so if you think about it, like if Facebook had a cross-site scripting vulnerability and you sent somebody a link to this thing and then you render the Facebook's page, they'd have the ability to set statuses, to delete friends, to do anything on your behalf because JavaScript has pretty much full control over the origin for which it runs. Um, so um, some examples of things you can do with uh, cross-site scripting. Um, anything the user can do all of a sudden you have that ability. You can steal data, you can change state on their account, um, you can create backdoors by exfilling session tokens or installing an app on their account. Maybe you install like a Facebook app because you're running code on their behalf. Um, but these are all, again, sort of peer-to-peer -peer attacks, not an attack on infrastructure. Um, if we look about how common cross-site scripting is as a vulnerability, these are like the hacker one's most common vulnerabilities. And you see it's like way on the list, all the way at the top, by a large margin. So cross-site scriptings are really, really common, and people are really, really used to seeing them in bug bounties. And that kind of normalizes us to them to an extent, um, which is kind of, it kind of sucks, because it is a pretty severe class of vulnerability within the scope of the origin that it runs on. Um, there are a couple of different types of cross-site scripting. I won't spend too much time going into them or all of them, I should say, but I will focus on the first two. Um, a reflected cross-site scripting is you go to an origin with some kind of parameter in the URL, um, so a link can be sent to you, and that parameter then injects JavaScript on the page. A stored cross-site scripting is basically some other user on the system stuck some data in a database somewhere, and then that got rendered out in another context. Um, and, and so at the bottom here, you sort of see this quote from Hacker One that like a reflected cross-site scripting vulnerability is, is probably less severe than a stored cross-site scripting vulnerability. I, I want to challenge that, and specifically I want to challenge that with regards to what I've talked, to so, talked about so far. Um, so basically, um, if, if, you, if you think about sort of what I've talked about, if you've got an internal Jenkins host, and the internal Jenkins host is building stuff in the environment, and it has the ability to spin up new hosts or to run code on other hosts in, in the environment, a cross-site scripting on that origin, reflected or, or stored, could potentially mean compromising your entire environment. Um, but a stored cross-site scripting would depend on a previous request being successful, storing something in the database, and then a second request to fetch that back out and render it. Whereas a reflected cross-site scripting is more drive-by. You click one link and then it runs. Um, so in this context, in a context where the attacker doesn't have access to the host in the first place, but they get some kind of reflected cross-site scripting on this weird open source thing that they're running internally, Tomcat Jenkins or something else I've never heard of, um, the reflected cross-site scripting can be a lot worse than stored cross-site scripting. 
you're not going to get stored cross-site scripting on a lot of those things, but you probably could find a reflected one if you look hard enough. And even if you did find a stored one, you wouldn't be able to store it because you'd need to be on that network. But you can trigger the reflected one by getting somebody to click a link who is on that network. Um, and if you were to find a stored cross-site scripting, you would need a cross-site request forgery bug to go with it to allow a state-changing request to happen so that you could send that subsequent second request. Um, so it's, it's, it's less likely, it's more complex, and the reflected cross-site scripting, I would argue, is a lot more deadly in this particular situation of targeting internal applications. Um, so sort of, again, the old way of thinking about this is like you attack a user, you steal a user's data, but I, I want to kind of shift that paradigm and sort of, and I know like other, other people in the industry, like Beef, for example, have started to shift that, but I, I want to shift it even more to, to make people more aware of the fact that these like dangerous web browsers sit on internal environments that, that can make network requests to any network that you're on, and you can use these webby attacks that seem harmless to attack infrastructure um, and, and to cause some real damage in an environment. Um, and so um, this is one example of uh, one that I submitted to a bug bounty. Review board is an open source tool for performing code reviews. You hook review board up to GitHub. It has the ability to pull projects from GitHub and um, anyone with access to review board can perform a code review. Um, I found that review board had no cross-site request forgery protection and there were several cross-site scripting vulnerabilities that I was able to find. And so when you think about that, I have the host name already because I've enumerated it passively. And then I can build a payload that targets that host name that if clicked by an employee would trigger one of these vulnerabilities. And the impact of that would be I now have the ability to run code on somebody's browser and that browser can make a request to an internal host and that host can access all the source code in your company and then I can steal it all. So end to end you click a link and all of a sudden I've stolen all your company's source code. That's, that's a pretty severe thing to do from something that we typically think is benign, cross-site scripting. Um, and I guarantee you, review board has not gone through an intense vetting process, and there's probably more vulnerabilities like that in it. Um, so the impact here is just way more severe than what we typically think of when we think of cross-site scripting. We're targeting an internal host, and if somebody clicks a link, it causes irreparable damage to the company, basically. Um, and so, like, that's the, you know, the, the, the kill chain here is, like, because it was a stored cross-site scripting that I found, you have to make one request to set the cross-site scripting, which you can do because there's no cross-site request for a protection, and then a second request to activate the cross-site scripting, which then exfiltrates all the data from the origin, um, which in this case would be all the, the source code or whatever source code you wanted to target. Um, so you can see here, review board fixed this cross-site scripting vulnerability and gave me credit for it. And then the bug bounty I submitted this to, which was unrelated to review board, also triaged this, and they upgraded their version. Um, so another example is there was another company that I was doing a bug bounty against. And, and I love doing these bug bounties because it's, I'm finding exploits on open source software stacks so I can talk about them. Like it's not locked down. I can, you know, it's, it's open source. I'm, I'm free to be more open about it. Um, so I'm, I'm doing some bug bounty on some company and they're running something globalsite.company.com. I Google global site. I find out it's an open source piece of software. And I just, I tear it apart. I find so many vulnerabilities in this thing. I found many cross-site scripting instance, instances, and I found a remote code execution, which was only triggerable if a user was logged in. But if we combine these two things together, if a user is currently logged in, I can use the cross-site scripting to trigger the, the remote code execution. And I can build this end-to-end -end link that if clicked, by a user at this company who's currently logged in, all of a sudden their browser targets this internal host and that host phones home. Um, so that kind of goes over what I just said. You install the web shell via the user making one request. You activate the web shell by making a second request and then that makes the host phone home. Um, and you can see they paid me out pretty well for that, um, nine grand for all of the issues. Um, they recognize this as a really severe issue. 
Um, but this was just one host in their environment, an open source host, which their security team had never heard of, never audited. And they had a ton of other hosts that I haven't looked at yet, and most companies do, of just weird open source stack running internally that you can target externally via these links. Um, so I want to spend a little bit of time talking about service workers, which is another new JavaScript feature that allows you to do these attacks in a more interesting way. A service worker's intent is basically to function as a fake server in the case the internet goes down. So you make a web request and a service worker kind of pretends to be the server and can service you in the event that there's no connectivity to the server. That's what it's designed for, but what it allows you to do is kind of weird. First, it allows you to run JavaScript for five minutes after the user closes the tab. Now, if you remember, I said 30 seconds is how long it takes me to sweep an internal subnet. For five minutes is how long I get to sit on that after the user has closed the tab. Um, that's kind of scary. Um, it only runs on TLS hosts. So if you were just sweeping the internal subnet, um, you probably wouldn't have much luck unless there's some crazy internal TLS tooling at that company. Um, but there is an exception to that, and I'll get to that in a bit. Um, they're slightly sandboxed, so you don't have full JavaScript execution abilities within a service worker, but you can make cross-origin requests, which means you can install cross-site request forgery attacks, and you can trigger cross-site scripting attacks. Um, so, you know, when I think of a service worker, this is what happened when I opened up an incognito window and viewed how many service workers were currently installed. Um, Google had already installed one. They're kind of like malware. They're little bits of code that can continue to run after I forget about the browsing context that I'm on. Um, and I, I personally don't want that. Like, I, you know, I, I use a VPN sometimes for some websites that I visit. I don't like the idea that they can figure out who I am if I turn the VPN off four minutes after I visit the website. Um, but the additional thing that they allow you to do is send all these requests to all these internal hosts. So if you find a bunch of internal hosts that are using TLS, um, you can have your service worker just go to town for five minutes on those things, could set up some command and control hook with beef, um, and you can just continue to slam those hosts for five minutes after the person closes the tab. There's kind of that thought when you have a cross-site scripting attack that it only runs for the short amount of time the person visits the page, and if they just close the page immediately, like you may be out of luck. But these give you five definite guaranteed minutes. Um, and here's that exception that I talked about before. It doesn't always have to be over TLS. There is one exception, and that's if you load a service worker over localhost. And you might be wondering, like, when can an attacker ever get somebody to load a service worker over localhost on somebody's workstation? Um, and I've kind of come up with a kill chain here that is a little outlandish, but it works. Basically, if you submit a file via bug bounty and claim it's some exploit, um, an HTML file, the person triaging the bug is probably going to run that on localhost, and they're probably going to do it on a privileged network, um, which means you could install a service worker on their machine on localhost that can run for five minutes after they close the tab, and now it can make insecure requests to their network, sweep the slash 24 that they're sitting on, um, and anybody running Jenkins or whatever else you're targeting, those hosts can phone home. Um, It'll still run for five minutes, um, and it'll just allow you to make insecure requests. Real quick, that's actually not true. It's the file origin. You run a, an HTML file uh, from a local path. Yeah, so. so the file origin, which has its own rules. It's not localhost. Localhost is its own. Yeah, I'll, I'll speak to that a little bit. So basically, the, the, uh, the person in the front said, like, if you just open the HTML file, it won't be running on localhost. It'll be running on the file origin, which is correct. However, there are different ways that you could coerce people to run it on localhost. For example, if you included a bunch of HTML files and you wanted those HTML files to be able to reference each other, then you can say, just spin up a Python HTTP server to make this work. And chances are the person triaging the bug is going to do it. Um, but that is a good point. Um, there are some other downsides to running things using the file origin. Um, there are some security implications to doing that. Um, we can talk more about them later, but um, it, it is a good point. Thank you for bringing it up. Um, but that's, that's basically the idea, that, that you, you can target these internal hosts um, through the web browser. You can do it in a very targeted fashion. 
the recon and all the information that you can learn about an internal network has gotten really, really sophisticated in the last couple of years. Um, and you can also figure out an inter a person's internal IP address because of a browser feature. Um, so that's basically um, that's, that's basically what what I have for you. Um, I'm hopefully bringing some visibility and, and bringing a new light into viewing these classical vulnerabilities. Um, I realized that a lot of that was like super technical, um, but hopefully like bringing it back up, the overall idea of like how much damage can happen if I click a link. Um, I, I just want to demonstrate that the answer is a lot. Um, does anybody have any questions? Question in the back. You were saying that service workers are primarily to service requests when the actual server is unreachable. Um, how difficult is it to induce a service worker to handle a response for a server that is up? Yeah, so um, if I understand the question, you're asking how do I install a service worker on an origin, basically? How can you install a service worker and then get it to respond to uh, respond for a server that's up? Yeah, so, so just rolling it back a little bit. Um, a service worker can be installed on an origin that you have control over. So if you have control over an origin, you can install a service worker for that origin. And it's designed to be like, a well, I'm going to install this just in case, in case I go down, then the service worker will kick in. But the service worker has the ability to also run while the server is up. It can run all the time. Yeah? How, how is control of the origin determined? Is that with standard course headers? Uh, control of the origin is, it, so the way you install a service worker, you visit a web page, a web page can run JavaScript on your page, and that JavaScript installs the service worker. And then it points to another file being hosted on the origin, and that file itself is the, or is, is the service worker. So you can't quite install a service worker if you get a cross-site scripting on an origin, for example. But if you have full control over the origin, like evil.com, and somebody visits evil.com, you could just install a service worker on that origin, no problem, and then use that service worker to make requests to the internal network. Yes? How easy is it to write a plugin for a browser that will simply kill all service workers when you close the tab, you know, provided that there are no other tabs for that domain that are still open? That's a great question. The question was like, can you write a browser plugin to just kill all service workers? I can do one better. Um, you can actually disable service workers as a feature. You can just, in Chrome, turn them off. But you might find it breaks some functionality on certain websites you use. Uh, Facebook, Google, they all install service workers, and they all do stuff with regards to their origin. Um, it might end up breaking stuff unintended. Question up front. Yeah, can I, uh, so let's say I direct somebody to a page that I own. Can I have JavaScript spin up the service worker and then immediately close its own tab so that it's backgrounded? And then the second question would be, can a service worker spawn a new tab? So the question is, if you visit a web page, can that web page install a service worker? Can I, can I close itself? Basically, like, I have a payload. I don't. I just want you to open this page yeah. in this browser. It's immediately going to install itself and then close the tab. And i got five minutes of execution. Yep. Unless you know about that, I've got it. I'm just um, repeating the question so that everyone can hear it. Basically, the, the question is, if you visit a web page, can the web page install a service worker and then close the main page? Um, it can certainly redirect you to another website. Um, I'm not sure if you have the ability to close a tab. My gut is that you do. Um, and then what was your second question? Uh, can a service worker open a new tab? Can a service worker open a new tab? Um, probably not, is what I would think. Service workers are somewhat locked down in the JavaScript that they can run. One of those things that they can do is make requests to other origins, but uh, my guess is that included in that subset of things is not the ability to open a tab, but I am not 100% on that. Um, there's a question in the back. First of all, really great talk. Thanks. Um, I was curious in the global site case, um, what recon did you do to find that? Because the security team said most of the where it was stood up, and then you're reporting to them like, hey, this is on your internal network. Yeah, so I don't remember exactly, but I'll give you a scenario that's perfectly plausible. I went to their certificate transparency. Um, I went to a certificate transparency log. I searched for their top-level domain, found all the subdomains, and one of the subdomains was globalsite.company.com. And then from that, I Googled global site, found out it was an open source stack, spiked on it, submitted the bug. Then they found this thing running that they weren't aware of, and it went from there. 
Yes. Coming at this from a little bit more of a blue perspective, on client side, what sort of behavior logging do you think would be beneficial to action? Yeah, so the question was like, from like a blue team perspective, what sort of behavior could you potentially fingerprint um, to identify this type of lateral movement? Uh, it's tough. Like, making HTTP requests internally is something that people do normally. Um, so being able to identify this, I mean, you can write um, signatures for the Metasploit library, but you don't know what you don't know about. So if I have an exploit on global site, and I build out a payload for that, you know, it's going to be tough to, to, to write a fingerprint for, for that when you don't even know what global site is and you don't know that it's in your environment. Um, what you could do is probably build some sort of heuristic on, like, if an internal host all of a sudden sweeps an entire network, um, but then you're kind of getting into, like, behavioral stuff, which is a lot harder to, to write rules for and to, to scale and to, to keep up with. Um, so it, it's tough, and I think that's another really good point that like this type of implant is a lot trickier to get attribution and to figure out what happened and to trace back the story of like, well, this host got malware on it all of a sudden, but like, where did that come from? Like, that host, you know, they themselves didn't click a malicious link. They didn't even know about the guy on the other side of the company that did. Um, so it's hard, um, and I'm not an expert in blue team by any means, but um, yeah. If that answer your question. So, sorry, but more from like, you know, watching something scan your entire network capture, I can pop an alert on that. But from the client side, watching, like, what's that sense that you're not, like, you go stealthy, you already know what your target is in the network, you're not going to try and do a network enumeration. You just go in and try and target a specific host, hit it with your specific area exploit, like you described in your, in, in your talk. And then, you know, you just pop it, you've got rootkit or whatever payloads you can put in there. So, so like, you're asking basically what kind of endpoint detection can we put on the host of the person clicking the link? As, a, as an option, yes, or perhaps even uh, what, are, are these legitimate things that are being used illegitimately that weren't designed to be used this way so maybe you could, like, Say no. You could do a, a browser side configuration that would just not allow these things to occur on, occur on internal networks. I think that would be tough to do. I think like we're using the browser the way it's intended to be used. Um, it's possible that you could maybe write some sort of plugin that detected if you visited an external host and then that external host is trying to do internal things. That seems like something that you could probably alert on. Um, but if you're if you have the headers, you'll have the origin and the host. If there's ever a mismatch between the origin and the host, it's a special case. There could be a cross-site request. So the origin header was introduced by browsers to be a method of limiting cross-site requests. And if you look at the OWASP CSRF cheat sheet. Both origin and refer checks are listed as a means of mitigating this attack. So that's a good point. Basically, the person in the front mentioned that if you cross-reference the origin header with the host header, you can potentially tell that this network traffic was done cross-origin. I think the problem you're going to have is a lot of these hosts are tar well, global site, for example, review board, for example, these were targeted against TLS endpoints. And so you'd need some sort of TLS introspection to be able to see that. And then you're going to have all the problems that go with full TLS introspection. Um, but it is a good point, and we could possibly build some sort of browser plugin, like the other gentleman mentioned, um, to be able to detect that kind of thing. A real blue team tool for this would have to reside on the client. I don't think you can put something out on the network to do this realistically without being like absolute, like, you know, you get to see every traffic that ever does all the time and there's not a lot of stuff like that. Totally. Um, except for the case where I mentioned of like somebody runs something a local host and then you're just sweeping that internal subdomain, that that could be all unencrypted that you could that could you view. Um, other question? Yep. Service is that it's okay. Uh, you know, I've worked in places where that is sort of the vibe, where it's like, 
you know, we don't, we don't need to worry about this too much because it's, it's not on the edge, you know. Yeah. So, yeah, so the, breaking that assumption is a good first step. The point uh, brought up was basically like, um, it, it falls back to what I said originally, that that fallacy of like having a hard security shell on the outside and a soft security shell is a good security model. I mean, that's a fallacy, right? It's not true. We all know it's not true. But like pointing some of this out, um, th this definitely, I think, brings more visibility to that. And like Google's beyond corp model of like, let's just kill the internal network entirely. I think that is, in my mind, the only like ironclad like, Solution to this. Beyond Corp, um, and I apologize if I bastardize this definition, but to the best of my knowledge, Beyond Corp is basically um, you have the ability to talk to the cloud. We're going to give you an access point. And that's it. You can't talk to your coworkers. You can't talk to printers. Like you have no internal network. That's SDP software. Okay. Thank you. Cool. Beyond Corp is also just kind of like. Your corporate network is only, it's like the same as plugging into Starbucks, you just have internet from it. But the only thing your network is giving you is internet, and a lot of the access controls are pushed up the like, layer seven. Um, and for all the bug bounty <laughs> enthusiasts in the room, I strongly encourage you to try this out. It's really, really easy to find these bugs. It's really, really easy to find these open source stacks ran. And like you're finding bugs on open source things that are ran all across the community. So you're giving back in a way that really gives back more than just a traditional bug bounty. But you might find pushback, which I did find at Review Board. They were like, we didn't write this, so we're not going to pay you. Um, so that, that side of it kind of sucks. But the upside is you get CBEs, you can talk about it, and you're giving back to the community in a better way, in my opinion. Yep, in the back. Yeah, with the, uh, like you're doing responsible disclosure with all the third party vendors, too. Uh, how do you do it with the timing? Like, can you reach out to the like, since you're going after the open source software that's on their domain, yeah. are you reaching out to the bug bounty first, or are you reaching out to the third party vendor So the question is, like, how do you do timing if you find a bug in an open source stack? Do you first reach out to the, um, like, Hacker One platform or whatever, or do you reach out to the vendor? Um, historically, uh, I am not a copyright expert, but the way I've treated this is when I disclose something to Hacker One. I am giving them intellectual property. I am giving them an exploit, and that belongs to them at that point. I'm not sure if that's, I haven't read the terms and conditions. I don't actually know if that's the way it works. But that's the way I've treated it. And then I've said, OK, well, I'm disclosing this to you. I'm giving you this exploit. What would you like me to do next? And nine times out of 10, probably 10 times out of 10, they're like, OK, go, to, go immediately disclose that to the vendor, and then CC us, and then we'll stay in the loop. Um, some other pushback you may get is like a company may say, well, you're just like spraying this across every single company you can find. Like that's not fair. You shouldn't be paid five times for the same bug. And so I try to do it on a one by one basis of like this belongs to you. I'm not disclosing it to anyone else. Like whatever you want to do, that's that's what we're gonna do. Um, other questions? Cool. Thanks everyone.